Welcome to Tales of Fae and Folk, and our second episode about Corvids. And this time we are going to look at the folklore of the Jay, the Magpie, Chuff, and Jackdaw. Corvids are incredibly intelligent birds, problem and puzzle solvers, sometimes even gift givers, and beautifully striking all of them. These birds have a duality in folklore, sometimes feared, and at other times they are good omens. Today we will look at just some of the folklore surrounding these intriguing birds. The Jay. These are beautiful birds. Of course, in the United States, there is the stunning Blue Jay. But here we are going to look at the Eurasian Jay. Although there is a huge commonality in folklore and symbolism shared between all Jays. Strangely, there is really not much folklore around this beautiful bird. Maybe because it is one of the more secretive of the Corvids not so keen on human habitats and farms, and so a folklore did not arise around the jay, the same as other corvids. The Eurasian jay loves woodlands and forests, and is identifiable by its soft pink-brown colour, with striking black and white markings, and its telltale turquoise blue patch on its shoulders, that were thought once to be collected by witches, to be worn at their sabbats. These omnivorous birds love to collect acorns and bury them in hoards for later use, just as the squirrels do. There is no doubt that many a fine tree has grown because of these forgotten stashes. The Celtic name for the jay is Hrichach Col, the screamer of the woods, and this is no surprise as they have a haunting, strange call, calling to other birds or warning when danger is near. The French name is Gai, meaning speckled. Italian, it is Pelegeta, meaning skin of many colours. It is also known as Jenny J, Kai, J Pie, J Piet, and its collective noun is a band of Jays. In France, folklore tells us that the jay was a cause and omen of the falling sickness, or as we call it today, epilepsy. However, this did not stop countryside folk from catching and cooking jays as an addition to a meagre and poor diet. In Haute-Bretagne, Upper Brittany, the people had a belief that jays who built nests in oak trees could never be caught and tamed, and these particular birds were extremely dangerous in their ability to pass on epilepsy. In the Austrian Tyrol, it was said that if you could find a jay's nest, you might be lucky enough to find a magical stone hidden inside it. These stones could make the possessor invisible, and it was believed that this magic was the reason why jay nests are very rarely found. It was believed that the jay gathered all the news and gossip during the week, and on a Sunday would tell the devil all his news, and apparently they fall into trances during thunderstorms. In ancient Greece, the jays foretold of a great famine, as they all left the woodland trees. There was a belief that every year a chosen jay would gather a single grain of sand and this they would take to the regions of hell and leave it there. Once the final grain of sand had been deposited, this would mean the end of the world. As the winter months were approaching, the country folk of England would watch the hedgerows to see if jays were gathering more berries or nuts than usual and if this was the case, they knew 
that they should prepare themselves for a very harsh winter. The magpie. Magpies are one of my favourite birds, looking like little folk in their best dress suits all black and white, and yet they are one that is often hated and misunderstood by humans, and they are full of magical folklore, both good and bad. Many will know the classic rhyme, one for sorrow, two for joy, and we will look at this a little more later. It was believed that the increase in magpie populations was the cause of reductions in other species of songbird, and yet on further studies it has been found that there is no actual evidence for this. However, this does not mean that the superstition is still not believed to this day. As with other corvids, they will eat anything, including small birds, and are often seen at bird feeding stations or jumping along the ground looking for opportunist food. And they are renowned for their love of collecting shiny things. There are many, many colloquial names for the magpie, Pi, Piet, Pianet, Pianet, Mag or Madge, Margaret or Margaret, Miggy, Nanpai, Ninut, Pi Mag, Pi Nanny Do, Marriott, Jacques, Jacquet, Bertha, Haggister Chatterpie, and Cornish Pheasant. The collective name for these birds is a tiding of magpies and I wonder if this is a connection to the rhyme, one for sorrow, two for joy. An ancient rhyme indeed, and a tool of divination. To see a magpie alone is said to be an ill omen, and to counteract this you must ask after its family and give it a salute, or even take off your hat. Hello, Mr. Magpie. How are Mrs. Magpie and all the little magpies? To add a little more protection, the saluter would spit over his or her shoulder three times and flap their arms like wings. In Somerset, in the southwest of England, folk carried onions at all times to ward off the bad luck of magpies, and if a single one was seen on the way to church in Yorkshire, it signified that death was present. The tradition was to cross oneself and repeat, Devil, devil, I defy thee. It is said that should a magpie's mate pass away, the widow or widower will summon magpies from all around in a wake, honouring the fallen bird until a new partner is found. In Wales, should you be about to go on a journey, to see a magpie travelling from right to left would mean that that journey would be a dangerous one and many, many times the travelling would be abandoned until a luckier day. The Yorkshire folk in the north of England knew magpies were associated with witches, a common theme with corvids of all types, and they would cross themselves upon seeing one. In Northamptonshire to see three magpies together predicted fires, and in Devon, fishermen on their way to their boats would look for magpies. Should they see even one, they would catch no fish that day. In Scotland, the belief was that magpies had a drop of the devil's blood under their tongue, and if one was seen nearby a window, then death would follow that bird to the house. There was also law that said to give the bird the gift of human speech. A scratch must be made on its tongue and a drop of blood from a human dropped in the wound. Anglers in spring dreaded seeing single magpies because this meant stormy and cold weather was on its way. One of the pair of birds would have to stay in the nest with the young, but to see two magpies was a good sign. The weather would be good fishing. Both of the pair were out hunting for food for their babies. 
In the north of England, there was a superstition of the magpies under the Bible. For example, one said that they refused to enter the ark, another that they didn't wear full mourning at the crucifixion, and this added to the bird's reputation for badness, even to the point where one tradition stated that in order to lay her eggs, the female magpie must suspend herself nine times from a tree branch as punishment for their lack of Christian respect. In Ireland it is said that the birds contain the souls of wicked and gossiping women. In Germany the magpie is a bird of the underworld and should one be squawking over your home an unwanted visitor is on their way. However, if they are chattering playfully then the visitor coming will be a positive one and there will be a happy reunion. Like the English spoken magpie rhyme, Germany has a similar divination chant telling us that one is unlucky, two brings happiness or a marriage, three a successful journey, four brings good news, five expect company. It was believed in Oldenburg that magpies were agents of the devil, and in other parts that to carve a cross on a tree where a magpie had nested would cause the birds to abandon their home. There is a strange and quite gruesome traditional tale in Austria that says that to catch and kill and boil a magpie will create a broth that can cause madness upon he or she who drinks it. And yet, near Dresden, one local priest was said to have cured epilepsy by giving doses of magpie broth to those with the condition. It is interesting the connection between the jay and the magpie and epilepsy. Sufferers of corns on one's feet, nicknamed magpies' eyes, could be cured by shouting at single birds, Ha ha, magpie, I have three eyes and you only have two. The corns would then slowly disappear. In France they are seen as more positive birds, even to the point that the country folk would tie bunches of bay laurel and heather high in the trees in their honour and in remembrance of when magpies would warn the country folk by shrieking high in the trees that wolves were nearby. The French people would watch where the magpies built their nests. If they were high up, then good weather was predicted for spring and summer. However, should the nests be lower down, they knew that storms and rains would be following for a long time. There was a belief that when the magpie left her nest, she would block the entrance with twigs full of thorns, and when she returned, she would bring with her a sprig of a plant called l'herbe de la reprise which I think could be stone crop. That is the closest I could find, but if anyone knows for sure, I would love you to let me know in the comments. Anyway, she would touch this plant to the thorny branches which would fall away, so she could be back with her eggs or chicks. And it was said that this plant grew beneath magpie nests, specifically for this purpose. Norse mythology mentions magpies. Here the winter goddess Skadi was the priestess of the magpie clan. Their black and white markings represented the balance between male and female and also sexual union. As time progressed the birds became omens of good luck. They were considered to be the steeds of witches or sorcerers heading off to their gatherings or even transfigured witches themselves. In Norway they are thought of as cunning birds, fey, belonging to the Hilda folk who live in the hollow earth. As birds bringing good luck, they are invited to watch over the home, and should one nest nearby a house, the household will defend that magpie with everything they have. The bird is considered a protector of that place, 
and woe betide any fool who disturbs that bird's roost, as the punishment will be swift. The people of Sweden believe that on Volpurgisnacht, sorcerers would transform into magpies to head off to their sabbat, called the Blackula. Magpies who had lost their neck feathers, as they do in August often, during molting season, would be thought of as ones that had carried a witch to the moot, and had lost feathers where the bridle had rubbed them away. The Manchu dynasty that ruled China between the 17th to the 20th centuries adopted the magpie as symbolic of their imperial rule over the land and the people. In Korea, magpies bring friends to the home and good news. They are bringers of good luck and fortune here too. And in Mongolia, it is thought that magpies can even control the weather. The First Nations tribes of the United States have always considered magpies a friend of the tribes, and rightly so. These birds deserve our respect. There is a tale told in many places around the world that varies here and there. Only the magpie knew the true art of nest building, and birds would come from all around to learn this skill. First, he said, you must lay two sticks this way. The crow butted in, yes I know that must be it. Next you must lay some moss, and on it a feather. The jackdaw nodded. I knew that must be so. Then said the magpie, placed on the nest tau, feathers, sticks and moss like this. The birds watched as the nest grew this way. And at this point the birds looked at each other. Yes, yes, cried the starlings. We all know how to do that. As the magpie reached half the building of the nest, he grew tired of the bird's sarcasm and he stopped. Well, he said, it seems you all know how to build nests, so you don't need me to teach you. And off he flew. And to this day, if you look at the magpie nest, you can see that they only learned half the building of a full-size nest. The magpie is indeed a peculiarly folkloric and magical bird, and many of us still here are able to chant the rhyme that tells of future comings. One for sorrow, two for mirth, three for a wedding, four for a birth, five for heaven, six for hell, and seven for the devil himself. There are many versions of this popular folk rhyme, and I would love to know what versions you know. The Jackdaw the jackdaw is a cheeky, smaller corvid, and they caused havoc with our thatched roof when we lived at our old cottage, picking bits of the reed out, looking for insects and throwing the stems on the ground. But we loved them anyway, as do many historical playwrights and poets. These birds are mentioned in so many scripts. Jackdaws are one of the corvids that live alongside we humans, in our towns and villages, and although noisy neighbours, they are companionable creatures. Many jackdaws have been hand-reared, and it has been found that they enjoy human company. We have a lot in common with these interesting birds. They love to be given puzzles and trained. They pair and mate carefully, as this achieves a higher status for the female and in captivity they will pair with birds of the same sex. Companionship is the thing that is all important. They are one of the birds that gather in large flocks, and we used to watch them many times in murmurations over the local fields, chattering to each other all the while. They even look cheeky, bouncing around with their grey neck feathers and bright blue eyes. They have many folklore names, Jack, Daw, Cador, Cadder and Caddy, Carder, Cordor, Chotard, Kai or Kaka, Wati, Cow, Cadow, Cades, Chalk, the College Bird, Jackador, 
jacko, kawati, the chimney sweep bird, and sea crow. And not surprisingly, its collective name is a clattering of jackdaws. In Wells in Somerset in the southwest of England, there is a belief that jackdaws can help predict the weather. On seeing one standing on one of the weather vanes of the cathedral tower, the locals will know to expect rain, and many say that this always comes to pass within 24 hours. In the north of England, should a jackdaw fall down your chimney, a death in the household would be following soon. And in Gloucestershire, single jackdaws were considered very bad luck indeed. There is a peculiar tale told that observers watching jackdaws building their nests at Raglan Castle noticed that they never reused once a twig that they had dropped, but they would fly off to find another perfect twig and bring it back. Brides and grooms on their way to their wedding would be thrilled if they saw a jackdaw because this would mean that great luck would be there for the young couple. It was told in early Christian mythology that the jackdaw, like all other black corvids, were once white, and they changed their coats to black on mourning the death of Christ. The magpie was too busy stealing shiny objects and only had half the time to change. I don't know what excuse the jay had then. The ancient Greeks believed it was easy to catch jackdaws, as all you needed was a bowl of oil for it to look at itself in. At that, the bird would fall into the oil and be easily caught. It had a dual nature in classical times, though. Ovid wrote that it heralded rain. Aesop had it as a character in one of his fables, a stupid creature who starved to death waiting for figs to ripen, an allegory for those who live on hope rather than being practical and acting to solve the problem immediately. Pliny, however, loved the birds as they ate grasshopper eggs. The jackdaw truly is a lovely little corvid bird, and they are welcome to peck the roof any time. The Chuff The Chuff was a bird so close to extinction in the UK now happily growing in increasing numbers and we are very thankful for that. These black and red or yellow legged long red beaked birds love to live in mountain areas or by coastal cliffs and because of this the other name in England for this bird is the Cornish Chuff, a place of coastlines and rugged cliffs. Celtic Cornwall is their stronghold here. Other colloquial names for the chuff are Cornish Door or Cornish Jack, Cornwall Kai, Red-Legged Crow, Killigrew, Chalk, Chalk Door, Chockard, Door, the Hermit Crow and the Cliff Door. And there is also Sea Crow. Its collective name is a chatter of chuffs. It was once said that they were mischievous birds stealing shiny things as of a corvid's will, and rumours spread that it would even steal lit candles and place them in the roofs of barns, or drop them in haystacks causing fires. There is a legend that says that King Arthur did not die, but his soul entered the body of a chuff. Why would this be? Well, the chuff is the totem bird of Celtic Cornwall, and of course Arthur was born at Tintagel, a Cornishman by birth in the legends. The castle sits on the Atlantic facing cliffs, the favoured home of Chuffs to this day, with its wild weather and high flying sea spray. And so King Arthur as a Chuff, the bird's red beak and legs telling of his plight and battle, his blood and in the country to this day it is forbidden to kill or harm a chuff, and also bad luck will befall them too. The chuff has become synonymous with Cornwall, 
Even the Cornish coat of arms proudly displays this beautiful bird alongside a tin miner and a fisherman. Even in Wales it is known as Bran Gernu, the Crow of Cornwall. In Irish Gaelic the chough is Cag Cosdair, in English the red-legged jackdaw, and they populate the Atlantic coasts there too. The chough is spoken of in Shakespeare's King Lear and also in A Midsummer Night's Dream. The Spanish writer Cervantes even mentions choughs in his Don Quixote. They do reside in Spain too, and in this Cervantes references the Arthurian legend of the soul of Arthur entering, as he says, a raven, but obviously it would be a chough, as the older legend tells. And finally, a beautiful piece by Sylvia Plath from her blackberrying. Overhead go the choughs in black cacophonous flocks, bits of burned paper wheeling in a blown sky. Theirs is the only voice, protesting, protesting. Isn't that just perfect? I hope you have enjoyed this time's telling of tales and the second part of my piece is dedicated to corvid birds. They are such intriguing and clever and very beautiful majestic birds. Long may they be with us. For now though dear friends and until next time, keep well, brightest of blessings and remember, don't, just don't play with the fairy folk or you may end up in one of my folk tales yourself.